Genesis 35 and not properly commenting Genesis 35, 8. So I'm going to give a proper commentary on Genesis 35, 8 first, and then we'll resume on Genesis 36. So in Genesis 35, 8, you might recall that Deborah died and Jacob buried her uh, underneath an oak tree at Bethel. Obviously, she meant a lot to Jacob because of the name Alan Bakuth. Part of the meaning from that word means weeping. It can also mean the weeping oak. So Deborah meant a lot to Jacob. The reason why is because she was Rebecca's nurse. So thinking about the culture of that time, or usually the job of, nurse, of nurses, is that they usually take care of their mistresses or... Uh, baby. So during that time when Rebecca uh, gave birth to Jacob, raised her children, Deborah was a part of that, helped to nurse Jacob. So I believe very strongly that that was the reason why Deborah meant a lot to Jacob. Uh, also another reason why is that Deborah is the one who accompanied Jacob that whole time. She wasn't with Rebecca. Rebecca, you might notice, she's totally AWOL for the next several chapters. But Deborah stuck with Jacob throughout that whole time. So Deborah meant a lot to Jacob. What her role was is that she was Jacob's nurse. Now, if that's the case, that she was there from Jacob ever since birth, the question is, when did she ever uh, get, uh, when, uh, oh, how do I say this? Uh, when Jacob ran away from home, did Deborah also go along with him? Or when did ever Deborah join Jacob uh, during his journeys? When did she ever join him? Because she's supposed to be Rebecca's nurse. So then the question is, when did she join? The answer to this question will be very likely when Jacob ran away. I think that's the answer. The reason why is because if we go back to the text uh, where Jacob ran away, which is Genesis chapter 28. In Genesis 28, there is not a single clue where it shows that uh, Jacob, that he took Deborah along with him. However, if you were to look at Genesis 28.10, it mentions that Jacob, he left his homeland and goes to a different direction. Now, if you recall the wording in Scripture, if you were to look at Isaac and if you were also to look at Abraham, it's pretty much the same thing. If you were to look at, for example, Genesis chapter 26, verse 1, Isaac is mentioned, but it never mentions anybody else or Isaac's nurse or Rebecca going along with him. It just simply mentions in the singular, Isaac uh, left from one land to a different location. It's the same thing with Genesis 28, where Jacob, singular, left from one land to a different location. Similar wording. But we can obviously know that in Genesis 26, 1 concerning Isaac's case, that Rebekah went along with him. And not only that, that he had servants and he had uh, people, or basically, uh, if you want to call a tribe, I don't know what you want to call it, but basically he had a tribes of people that he had to take care of. Uh, it's pretty apparent from Genesis 26, 7 that Rebekah went along with him. And even the case, if we were to go back to... Uh, Abraham's case, when you recall what the scriptures read, when Abraham went from one location to another location, if you look at Genesis 12, verse 4, Genesis 12, 4, that, uh, Abraham, uh, that Abram departed and then uh, as the Lord called him. So it's used in the singular, uh, it's used in the singular form when he left. But it's taken for granted when he left in the singular tense that in verse 5 he has a whole bunch of people going along with him, right? So from these cases in Scripture, it's going to be 
uh, it's going to be some common sense when the Bible mentions a singular person who leaves from one location to another location. It doesn't necessarily mean all the time that it's only going to be one person. For all you know, he could have brought uh, people along with him, slaves, servants, nurses, whoever. Now, if we were to think about the wise men, for example, in the book of Matthew, uh, you'll hear the Christmas story that's basically three wise men, right? But they only uh, come up with that because of the three different gifts. It doesn't mean that there are only three wise men. To be more likely and rational, there's no way that uh, three wise men all the way from a faraway land could travel successfully through many miles without uh, getting raided, without getting hurt along the way. They needed uh, bodyguards, they need servants, they need a huge group of people. Usually when you make a long travel, especially from a faraway land, you need a caravan. You need a, a huge, uh, you need some numbers of people. So it's important to keep that in mind. And if Jacob uh, made that long journey as well, think about it. If Jacob made that long journey from Beersheba to Padanaram, then think about his mother who also took the journey from Padanaram to Beersheba. Same journey, same path. Remember, because his mother, Jacob's mother, Rebecca, came from Padanaram area. And she had to go to Beersheba to marry Isaac. But when she went along that, that route, obviously, she was not alone. She came with a caravan. If you were to think about Abraham's servant, obviously, Abraham's servant didn't go by himself from Beersheba to Padanaram. Abraham's servant took along a caravan, a bunch of camels, a group of people with him. So if you were to add all these things together, then it would make sense that Jacob, if used in the singular tense, that he went from Beersheba to Padanaram, that, he, that there's a group of people who also went along with him. That wouldn't be any surprise. And if you were to look at Genesis chapter 24, then uh, you can see that as well. If you look at Genesis 24, 10, Genesis 24, 10, notice that this servant, he went through the same route that Jacob went from Beersheba to Padanaram. Now, he may not have went the exact, all the directions, but basically the location in his GPS destination is the same, okay? Basically, I'm going to go to Padanaram from Beersheba. That's what Jacob did too. When you look at verse 10, the servant took 10 camels. It's singular, right? Servant took 10 camels of the camels of his master and departed for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia unto the city of Nahor. Now, look at this. The servant singular tense made that long journey and he took 10 camels. Do you think one person can do that? Obviously not. So he had to take different slaves or different groups of people to travel along with him. Okay, so uh, all these... Uh, all these comments would build up and make it more logical of what's going on in Genesis 35.8 on Deborah, where she made the journey with Jacob as well. Okay, going to Genesis 36 now. The Bible says in verse 1, now these are the generations of Esau, who is Edom. Remember that Esau's other name is Edom, if you might recall that. Esau's other name is Edom, and we've seen that. Uh, when we go back to the book of Genesis, when Esau sold his birthright, and when he did that action, the Bible says, therefore, his name was called Edom. And that would be at Genesis chapter 25, I believe. So let me go back there real quickly. If you want to go back there too, that's fine. Uh, if you go to Genesis 25:30, there you go, Genesis 25:30. Notice that his name also means Edom. Now, Edom, uh, it means, as I've told you before, it means reddish brown, right? It means reddish brown. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but in Genesis 36, 1, the Lord gave you a clue here. Esau 
His name also means, believe it or not, Rome. Believe it or not, it means Rome. So that's why there are some uh, commenters, commentators who will try to put uh, any negative thing in the Bible concerning Rome and they'll tie it to Esau. Now, I think that some of it could be true. I think some of it could be true because Esau, the Bible says, will face judgment at the tribulation. But we do know the, the location that's being judged is Babylon, which is also uh, in the Bible known as the Roman Empire. We know that. But then the reason why all these locations share these, uh, the reason why this same location is sharing all these different location names is because it has the same Babylonian or Nimrod Semiramis spirit. If you were to recall that, that's the reason why all of them are connected together. It's like the body of Christ. No matter what location you are, uh, I could be in one location. Uh, there's brothers and sisters in Christ in communist countries or in Muslim countries who are suffering persecution. But in spite of being different locations, we're all in the same body of Christ. So why can't the devil do something like that too with his own spirits, right? So you can have different locations like Rome, Babylon, or Edom, but it could be the same, one in the same body, so to speak, of evil. So there could be a possibility to that. But I say possibility because I believe in literal interpretation of the scripture, and I believe that Esau's location will truly be judged. So it's important to make sure to prioritize a literal interpretation whenever it's possible. And it is possible to maintain that location as literal as the literal interpretation. All right, we're going to go to Genesis 36, 2. Esau took his wives of the daughters of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Aholibamah, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion the Hivite, and Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister, sister of Nabajoth. So we see right here, the Bible says Esau, took himself wives from the daughters of Canaan. That's already a negative start where we do know that Esau married with the daughters in the land of Canaan, the ladies of that region. In Genesis 36, 1, it's going to comment all the generations of Esau. So we're going to see his family tree. The wives that he took from the land of Canaan are as follows in verse 2. Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite. So I already uh, wrote it all out right here. Basically, uh, uh, there's one person that I forgot to connect here. Um, where are you? Um, okay, I probably didn't write her name down here. I'll have to write it later. <laughs> but there are uh, three names here that Esau married. Third name is not written here. I don't know why I didn't write it yet, but eventually I'll write her name down once I get there, okay? But three names, uh, we see Aholibama, and then we see Ada, who's the daughter of a Hittite named Elon, and then I mentioned Aholibama before, but she's the daughter uh, of Anna, but Anna is the daughter of Zibion the Hivite. So he married Hittites and a Hivite. And Bashamath, Ishmael's daughter, sister of Nabajoth. So Bashamath is Ishmael's daughter. And then she's also sister to Nabajoth. Now, if you look at these three names, I've commented on them before. I'm not going to really repeat them again. But if you look at Genesis 28, there seems to be a contradiction when you compare that with Genesis 28 and 26 because of the names. So then the commentators, they'll probably, <clears throat> they'll say that basically Bashamath is a different name. Uh, so this woman, Bashamath, could be referring to a different name. It's the same person, but two different names, since it, con it seems to contradict Genesis 28. Or they'll uh, say that there's a scribal error in your King James Bible because the names are pretty similar. But as I... As I've explained to you, there are several interpretations for this. One of them is that Genesis 36, verse 2 and 3 doesn't have to name you all of his wives. 
It doesn't have to necessarily restrict to three. Uh, the second interpretation <coughs> is that even though these names are mentioned, how do we not know that Esau married not just the daughter of so-and-so, but also uh, their sister as well? And if he married their sister as well, they would have very similar namings, perhaps. So it's very possible in that sense. But if you go to my previous uh, commentaries on Genesis uh, 28, it'll cover Genesis 28, 26, the so-called apparent contradiction. But let's resume on the genealogy here. Verse 4. And Ada, so we're going to go to Ada's line here, so you want to take a look at that. Bear to Esau Eliphaz and Bashamath bear rule. So we see that uh, these two ladies here, Bashamath and Ada, they gave birth to Eliphaz and Rule. Now, um, I'm going to read you <clears throat> some of the names from Dr. Upman's commentary. He has their meanings. Usually, I, uh, I'll do the meanings of their names. So if you want to write it down, I would suggest that you would write it down because I ain't going to write it down. I already wrote down enough names for you. So... <laughs> So here are the meanings of their names. So Eliphaz means strength of God, or my God is strong. Strength of God, or my God is strong. Now this is very interesting, is that all of Esau's children's names, they're all spiritual, all right? They're all spiritual. But from what we read in the book of Hebrews, Esau was a lost man. Now you know what that shows right there? This is important to understand. Esau comes from a family that's basically Christian, so to speak, or right, saved, believer. But in spite of coming from a saved, believing family, he still is a lost sinner and headed for hell. All prodigal life and then all fleshly. You know, from Esau's life is that he, want to, he was a very fleshly person. He rejected the birthright. He, re, uh, he missed out God's blessing. He wanted to live his own way for what? Something fleshly pottage stew. So that's a typical great example of basically the next generation Christian, so-called Christian, so to speak, who can come from a Christian family, but still is a lost sinner, only Christian by so-called culture or by name. That's it. Not truly a say believer. Also, they might have Christian tendencies for their children. They might have some Christian beliefs. Great example is the Koreans. Uh, there's a lot of Korean churches, and they'll put themselves as Christian or Protestant. But if you know your history, the background, the majority of them are actually very lost because it's a mingling of shamanism and Buddhism. So they, a lot of times they don't see the difference with Buddha and Jesus. Sometimes they'll see that as the same God, which is uh, very, very messed up, which is very, very messed up. So the Korean people, they might have the Christian tendency, so to speak, the Christian morals, so to speak, that they'll carry on from their family, but it doesn't mean that they're saved or not, uh, they're saved group of Christians or they're saved believers. They only take it by name. So you have to be very careful with this Christianity that it's not dead orthodoxy you're practicing, but it's truly a living entity, a real life that you're living under. So what you got to always ask yourself when you come to church is that, look, are you coming here for culture, just uh, for tradition, or this is your own decision because you know this is something as part of your own life and heart. It's something real and genuine. So you always have to keep that in mind. When we have children, the scary thing is, is that they will be born and grown up in a Christian family or home or background, but the fleshly tendency will rise for them. And the reason why is because they're so used to a clean background that they want something fleshly. So that's a dangerous thing that you have to protect your children under. And that's what unfortunately happened to Esau. And he died in his sins and went to hell. Even though for his own children, he gave them Christian names. See that? But it's only by tradition. Keep that in mind. Now, if you recall your genealogy in Genesis, like Genesis 5, for example, do you recall how I showed you the tendency and the pattern of man where they spiritually go down, down, down every generation? Right. So if you recall that, you're going to notice the same 
tendency in here. Nothing changes when men learn from history is that men never learn from history. So what you better believe it that if history repeats itself, that Esau's generation will repeat Genesis 5 generation, Genesis 4 generation. And if that's proven to be true, it will repeat in this generation as well. So it's important to keep an eye on that. Okay, now look at these names. Rule means friend of God, friend of God. Then we continue on. Aholibama bear Jeush and Jalam and Korah. These are the sons of Esau. Okay, I do not know why I did not write a single one of their names here. I thought I would have that. Okay, so let me write it right now, okay, before we get lost here. Let me redeem myself. Okay, so Aholibama. Let's see right here. Where are you? Okay. She gave birth to three sons. The three sons are as follows that you want to remember. Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. Jeush, Jalam, and Korah. I will give you the meaning of their names as follows. So Dr. Rutland mentions that Jeush... His names mean whom God hastens or whom God hides, whom God hastens or whom, oh, excuse me, excuse me, whom God hastens, sorry, whom God hastens, whom God hides is for Jalem, whom God hides is for Jalem. Korah means, <laughs> how funny, baldness, Korah means baldness, you see a bald person, just call him Korah, all right? All right, and then we'll see right here the next verses. If we look at verse 5, O holy Bama, bear Jeush, and Jalam, and Korah. These are the sons of Esau, which were born unto him in the land of Canaan. So that's self-explanatory. These three names are the sons of Esau, and they were born to him. And where? The region of Canaan. And Esau took his wives and his sons and his daughters and all the persons of his house and his cattle and all his beasts and all his substance, which he had gotten in the land of Canaan. Okay, why is it so descriptive? That's self-explanatory. Basically, he took everything that he got. His children, his daughters, sons, everybody that's in his household, all of his livestock and then everything that he owns that he got in the land of Canaan and went into the country from the face of his brother Jacob. So he went into the country that's away from the face or the presence of Jacob. That's the idea. Now it says the country. The reason why it says the country is because it's already known which country that Esau came from originally. Now this is a strange thing. If you recall when Jacob met Esau, where did Esau come from as he was trying to meet Jacob along the way? If you look back at Genesis 32, he was coming from e Seir at Genesis 32, 3. That's a country, all right? So that's why it says the country, because it's known before. It's been mentioned before that we know where Esau comes from. He comes from Seir. So here's a strange thing. If Esau originally came from Seir, which is right here, okay? If he originally came from Seir, then why is it that all of a sudden he's in Canaan? And then he's in Canaan, where Jacob is, about, is growing in that land, and then Esau takes all that he owns and then leaves Canaan away from Jacob, his brother, and goes into Seir, the country where he comes from. So you're following what I'm saying right here? What I'm saying then is this, is that Esau wasn't in Canaan all that time. He originally came from Seir. But remember, how did he end up in Canaan? So how he ended up in Canaan, if you recall, was his dad when he passed away at Genesis 35, 29, right? So he had to be there. So what could have happened, think about this, okay? 
Remember, Esau wanted to be with Jacob. Do you recall that, Genesis? If you recall at Genesis 33, Esau wanted to be with Jacob. He wanted to be with the family. But Jacob bailed out on Esau. So then Esau meets Jacob again, and then, can you imagine? Hey, where were you? <laughs> and Jacob's already getting on uh, his older brother's good side. And he was scared of him before. He ain't going to do this again. So there's no way he, uh, no matter how crafty or sneaky he is, he can't dodge this one. So probably Jacob, he was like going, oh, well, you know, what happened was, is, you know, I had to, you know, my livestock, my children, my family, they were just getting tired. And my wife mentioned she wanted to go to someplace over there. So I went over there and something tragic happened. My daughter got raped and then my sons just slaughtered a whole bunch of people in the city. You know, trying to win Esau's sympathy, maybe. And Esau's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. That must have been rough. And Jacob was like, yeah, it's been rough. Uh, but now everything's all right now, right? And he's like, uh, eh, yeah, yeah. And then he's like, well, now you can stay with me, you know? Yeah, you know? So then Esau <laughs> stayed with Jacob then. So there was no way Jacob could go around that. But Esau, he had to leave Jacob now at verse 6. And the explanation is given at verse 7. Verse 7. For their riches were more than they might dwell together. Meaning that both Esau and Jacob's riches is so much more than they can handle to manage living together with. So they just have so much stuff. So they need, uh, this land ain't big enough for the both of us on everything we own. Hence, the next part of verse 7, and the land wherein they were strangers could not bear them because of their cattle. So that's another meaning. <coughs> the land of Canaan that they're living in, remember, that's not their homeland either. Remember, they're sojourners. They're temporarily residing there. They're not citizens of that place. They're basically immigrants of that place. Because of that, Due to their cattle growing, the whole land itself, Canaan, or the inhabitants of that land, couldn't bear them, couldn't tolerate them. They're saying, you immigrants are growing too big over here. We need you to kick you out. We need you to leave. So then, because of that, Esau was the one who left, not Jacob. In verse 8, thus dwelt Esau in Mount Seir. Uh, Esau is Edom. So, e hence... Esau lived in Mount Seir. So the region of Seir has a mount. And the verse explains again, Esau is Edom. Why would it say that? Because what we know, know to be Seir later on in the Bible is the land of Edom. It's going to be the land of Edom when you read your Bible. So that's why the author makes it very clear that Esau is Edom. Because when he goes to the region of Seir, um, it's going to be known as Edom. Now... The thing is, if you keep reading this passage or this chapter in Genesis 36, Seir is not Esau's own land. All right? Who owns it is Seir. When you look at Genesis 36, 20, all the way to verse 30. That's not Esau's generation. That's Seir's generation. But the reason why Seir is mentioned is because Esau married into that family. That's the reason why he was able to live there, because of his father-in-law. But that's the reason why God uh, despised Esau, because now his people intermingled with the devil's crowd. And I'm going to show you, possibly it could be Nephilim Rephaim. There's a verse that clues that in, and you wouldn't guess which verse it would be. But there's some verse right here in this passage that can indicate that, that I'm going to show you. There's no, it's no wonder God hated Esau's uh, nation and his people because of his actions that he did that turned into that. If we were to uh, go back to Genesis 36 and verse 8, Esau, he would be the one who is most feared by Jacob. He would be the one who has a stronger arm. Why would he move out? Because you cannot break scripture and you cannot break what God promised. Esau knows full well who the birthright goes to, who the blessing goes to. 
So I, it could be this. It could be that God put a divine hand somehow where maybe Esau had the fear of God and left. Or number two, Esau at least had the common sense gist that this property belongs to my younger brother Jacob's, not me. So I'm going to go back to my homeland, Seir. All right, because I already lived there before. I resided there before. I can just simply go back there. All right, let's go. Uh, let's return to our text. If we look at verse 10, these are the name of Esau's son. Eliphaz, the son of Ada, the wife of Esau. All right, that was already explained here. Ruled the son of Bashamath, the wife of Esau. That's already explained right here, right? So we already see these both sides. And the sons of e Eliphaz. Now notice right here, it doesn't mention Aholibama. Now you might say, why is that? Because Aholibama, which is the reason why I didn't write that here, is very distinguished. Aholibama is going to be very important because she has to do with probably Rephaim Nephaim. She comes from this line. So, it's strange how the Holy Spirit distinguished that line. And then the, Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit distinguishes the line even more when he comes to 20 through 30. That, that's Seer's generation. The Lord mentioned that distinction for a reason. Because he's trying to show there's something here, you, uh, there's something uh, that you haven't thought of before. There's some sort of distinction we should note. We'll come to that later, okay? If I can make it, and you better pray to God that I make it, okay? Then I'll give you that, then I'll give you that theory of mine. Um, and the sons of Eliphaz were Teman, Omar, Zepho, and Gatam, and Kenaz. So if you're ever having trouble naming what your baby or your newborn child would be, then take out Genesis 36 and then pick a name, all right? So right there. All right, so... With good luck, you might hit a Rephaim or a Nephilim name too, okay? <laughs> All right, now, T-man, he means sun burnt. He means sun burnt. Omar, he means eloquent. So we're right here, obviously, Eliphaz line. Omar, he means uh, eloquent or mountain dweller. Now, did you notice something right here? There's something important. Is that... With his name, he gets a spiritual name from his father. You notice this guy wasn't as spiritual. Why? As I told you, history repeats itself. Generation that goes on a spiritual decline, the next generation will be more spiritually declined. So there's no, nothing of a Christian or spiritual principle involved with Eliphaz's case. Zepho. He, his name means watchtower. His name means watchtower. Gatum, his, mean, uh, his name means their touch, their touch, or dried up, dried up. Kenaz means hunting. Kenaz means hunting. Timna, Timna means restraint. Timna means restraint. And that's where we come to verse 12. And Timnah was concubine to Eliphaz, Esau's son. And she bare to Eliphaz Amalek. These were the sons of Ada, Esau's wife. So notice right here, uh, Timnah is a concubine. She's a concubine uh, to Eliphaz right here. But she gives birth to a son named Amalek. She gives birth to a son named Amalek. There are, if you recall that uh, name, it has to do with Amalekites, where God says he won't remember that generation. A lot of preachers will use that name as a reference to the flesh, symbolism to the flesh, or utter destruction. Right. Amalek is very interesting. His name means... Uh, Warrior, his name means warrior, but if you look at uh, the Hebrew wording behind it, it could have several meanings. It can mean sin, it could also mean mischief, or pinching off. Pinching off. 
Very interesting. So that's why his name connects a lot to fleshly things. No doubt a type of the flesh. Continuing onwards, verse 13. And these are the sons of rule. All right, now we come to uh, rule's line right here. Eliphaz was already mentioned with his sons. And then Timnah on the side. Uh, I'll write that down. Well, why not? Okay. So then, and then Timnah was mentioned on the side to give birth to Amalek. What happens when you don't do what God intended in uh, marrying one wife or a good wife? See? If you want to play sex and then uh, have multiple, then what happens uh, during that timeline, that's what this happened, right? Think about Hagar, right? Concubine, same thing. The mess happened with Abraham. Okay, continuing on. Mm, now we're going to go to rules children. Let's go through this quickly. Nahath, uh, verse 13, Nahath and Zerah, Shama. And Mizah, these were the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife. So all these names I mention are Bashamath's children. And Bashamath, remember, is Esau's wife. All right, here are their names, meanings. Nahath means going down. Nahath means going down. Zerah means rising. Zerah means rising. Shama means, uh, there are different meanings here. Wasting, so it could be a negative thing, wasting. Or it could mean fame, fame, positive, either or. Miza means fear. It means fear, negative. Or it could be not a negative name, sprinkling, sprinkling, fear or sprinkling. And these were the sons of Ahalibama, the daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. Now notice the wording here is very different. It goes the sons of Ahalibama, daughter of Anna, daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. You don't see that with uh, the other two wives, right? You don't see that. It just simply goes where, yeah, it just, it just, it just goes with rule and it goes with Eliphaz, right? But they make a distinguishing that Ahalibama has to be mentioned when we're going to cover uh, Esau's children here. Now, we're like thinking, why would Ahalibama have to be distinguished and mentioned? Because it goes Ahalibama, daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, Esau's wife. If you were to jump down at Genesis 36, then you can see right here that it connects to the line of Seir. Verse 20, these are the sons of Seir, the Horite, who inhabited the land. Lotan and Shobal and what? Yeah. Zibian. See that right there? Zibian. And Anna. So we see here the names of Seir's family tree. And then when you are to jump down on, let's see right here, if you were to jump down at, ooh, we can go to 25. We can go to 25. And the children of Anna were these. Daishan and notice right here, Ahalibama, the daughter of Anna. Now, the Holy Spirit made a specific mention, Ahalibama, the daughter of Anna. All the other names, like Daishan in verse 25, or the other names, is not mentioned with that distinction. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's trying to connect those names together. See that? It's trying to connect the names of Ahalibama to Anna to Zibian. That's what it's trying to do. Verse 24, we see right here, and these are the children of Zibion, both Aja and Honor, and Anna. And this was that Anna that found the mules in the wilderness, etc. So we see that connection there. Now, continuing on, if we were to go to, let's see right here, verse 14. And she bare, uh, verse, the middle of verse 14 reads, And she bare to Esau Jeush and Jalam and Korah, which was already mentioned right here, right? Ahalibama gave birth to these three names. And their names were already mentioned. Verse 15, These were dukes of the sons of Esau, the sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn of Esau. 
And then it's reviewing the names again, pretty much. It's reviewing all their names again. But this time, it's referring to royalty line. It's not just going to give the, uh, the sons of Esau's name. We saw the first verses as a more of a personal uh, family genealogy. Now from 15 through 19 is going to be a royalty kingship genealogy. So Esau's children had dukes. Now this is the first mention pretty much of duke in your uh, Bible. Or I think, uh, I think Ishmael had that. I'm not sure. But anyway, the point is, is that we see here that Duke is mentioned. Let's see. These were the Dukes of the sons of Esau. The sons of Eliphaz, the firstborn son of Esau. Duke Teman, Duke Omar, Duke Zepho, Duke Kenaz. So Esau's children became Dukes and his son Eliphaz had children who also became dukes. Eli Eliphaz is the oldest son of Esau, and his children are Teman, Omar, Zepho, Kenaz. Now, there's something interesting about Esau's line, the Canaanites' line. They make a big deal in tying to king and royalty. Okay? If you recall, um, if you want to talk about the very first king, probably, in history, or a king of all kings, a king, not the king of kings, amen? A king of kings. It wasn't Nebuchadnezzar, it was actually Nimrod. Nimrod with this first empire. So I, uh, Isaac, Jacob, Abraham's line, is not king or duke. Nothing like that. The reason why is because God is their king and ruler. But rem the Jews, they wanted to be like all the nations. And they were referring to the Canaanites. They were referring to their enemies. All that line is connected, royalty line, the Canaanites. Why do they want that? Because if you uh, recall Nimrod and then also the Canaanites, they all tie to Antichrist uh, somehow lineage or Antichrist dealings. The Antichrist is supposed to be a king of kings too. They all want to rule. Why? Because Satan is the God of this world. Right. Satan said at Luke to Jesus, all these kingdoms of the world are mine. Yeah. He's known as the God of this world. So because of that, they want to be known by that. I'm a king, I'm a king, I'm a king. But God's children are not known to be that. Right. You might say, why? Because you're sojourners here. Yes. The world's not worthy of you. Yes. All right? You're not a king of this place. You will, but not now. You will. This world will belong to us one day. We will rule, but not now. This is the devil's empire and kingdom. So believe it or not, what we're living under is, uh, if you're a millennial, believing that God is reigning in the kingdom right now, your God's the devil. Come on. This is the devil's millennial kingdom right now. Yep. That's what you got to realize. You might say, how dare you? Really? You call God's kingdom... Uh, a perf uh, the right kingdom when there's disease, famine, yep. rape, crime, all, right. all these things going on. Great. Thank God's kingdom. God's kingdom's perfect, holy, pure. Yeah. I wouldn't blaspheme my God by calling this his kingdom. Yeah. Okay. This sin all around you, you call this God's kingdom? No stinking way. No stinking way. They try to make, that's why they try to make it a spiritual kingdom. Doesn't change the fact the spiritual environment around you when you look at it is a complete mess. Yep. I'll try to say God's spiritual kingdom in competition with the devil's spiritual kingdom. But you got to realize this is that it shouldn't still be in competition. Yeah. If God's kingdom is reigning, that means he should be reigning over. Yes. He should be already. He should have already conquered the devil's kingdom, right. not fighting with each other in the world. OK, continuing on. If we were to continue on the dukes, we go in verse 16 now. Verse 16, Duke Korah, Duke Gatim, and Duke Amalek. These are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. These were the sons of Ada. So we see right here that the other dukes are, uh, the other sons are mentioned. Dukes are mentioned from Eliphaz lineage. And then it includes uh, Amalek. If it includes Amalek, it should be Timnah's son. But the verse says, these are the dukes that came of Eliphaz in the land of Edom. 
and it comes from Ada. Why is that? Because during that time, a concubine, uh, when, they give, uh, when they give birth to children, they'll give birth to children in their mistress' stead. You might recall Sarah also did the same thing with Abraham. Let Hagar give birth in my stead, so to speak. That's the idea. So that's why it would be uh, considered to be Ada's son that time. Because remember, what was considered to be the property of the owners that time were slaves. That was common during that time period. You might say, how horrible. But if you were there that time period, they would just think it as normal. And if they were in your time period right now, they would say, how horrible. It's all the same thing. Cultures are different. Okay? Cultures are different that time. If we were to go to verse 17, the next one. And these are the sons of Rule, Esau's son. So now we're going through Rule's line. Okay? And the names were already mentioned before, but now it's in royalty with their titles. The sons of Ruel, and Ruel is Esau's son, is as follows. Duke Nahath, Duke Zerah, Duke Shama, Duke Mizah. These are the dukes that came of Ruel in the land of Edom. That's self-explanatory. These names uh, are dukes that came from Ruel, and they live in Edom. These are the sons of Bashamath, Esau's wife. They come from Bashamath, Ishmael's line. And Bashamath is Esau's wife. And these are the sons of Aholibama, Esau's wife. Duke Jeush, Duke Jalem, Duke Korah. These were the dukes that came of Aholibama, the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. That's self-explanatory. The sons of Aholibama, who is Esau's wife, are as follows. They're Jeush, Jalem, Korah, and they're given their title as dukes. These are the dukes that came from Aholibama. And remember, she's the daughter of Anna, Esau's wife. So Aholibama comes from Anna. And Oholibama is Esau's wife. The distinction again with Oholibama. See that? It keeps sticking with Oholibama, the daughter of Anna. Oholibama, the daughter of Anna. Bashamath didn't get that one. And then uh, the other people didn't really get that one. So that distinction is so important because we're going to come to the next verse very soon. Another interesting thing is this, is that I, to my knowledge, I could be wrong, Bashamath, should have been uh, married later, and then Oholibama should have been married uh, prior to Bashamath. So the sequence should go, basically, the sequence should go with, uh, let's see right here. So basically, Oholibama's lines should be mentioned first, and then after that, Bashamath lines should have been mentioned next. If, if we were to go by sequence, of who Esau married first. The guesswork from that is because of Genesis 28 and 26. Remember in Genesis 26, Esau married the, the Hittites and the Hivites first, and then Ishmaelite was last. So why is Ishmaelite mentioned prior, uh, first, and then this Canaanite was mentioned last? Unless the Holy Spirit wants to make that distinction again. See? So there's something very distinct about her line, and you're all, I know, you're all, you all want to know before the clock runs out, all right? But I'm just trying to explain the passage here. It's because it's following the context of verse 20 through 24. You see how uh, verse 18 and 19 is right next to 20 through 24? That's the reason why. It's following that same flowing context, Sears lineage. All right, let's hit there quickly. Verse 19, these are the sons of Esau, who is Edom, and these are their dukes. So all those names mentioned before are Esau's son. And remember, Esau's AKA is Edom. And those are also their dukes in the land of Edom. Verse 20, these are the sons of Seir the Horite, who inhabited the land. The sons of, uh, so now we come to Seir's lineage, and we're going to look at his sons. Seir is a Horite. He inhabited the land of Canaan, okay? We're going to compare uh, Genesis 36. If he is a Horite, look how this would go. If we were to go back to Genesis, let's see right here, 26, Genesis 26. We're going to connect some of the names, and it's going to be interesting how the Word of God connects the names. If we go to Genesis 26, 34, and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith, the daughter of Beri the Hittite, 
and Bashemath, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah. Now, these are Canaanites, right? If you think about Canaan, obviously you can't forget the Nephilim or the giants. If we go to Genesis 36 again, the context, Genesis 36 again, Oholibama, she comes from Seir, who's a Horite, correct? All right, if he's a Horite, look at this. In verse 2, Genesis 36, 2, Esau took his wives of the daughter of Canaan, Ada, the daughter of Elon the Hittite, and Oholibama, right? So she should come from Horites, right? Keep reading. The daughter of Anna, the daughter of Zibion, the what? Hivite. Hivite. So God sees Horite and Hivites as interchangeable. Horite and Hiv Hivites, probably Hivites is a more accurate pronunciation, as interchangeable. If they're the same, go to Deuteronomy 2. Deuteronomy 2. Here's the interesting history. What happened in the land of Seir and Esau? In the land of Seir and Esau. Something very interesting happened. We're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 2. And we're going to read verse, let's see right here, verse 12. Verse 12, okay? The Bible says the Horims also dwelt before time. Look at that. Horim, that's close to Horite, right? At Genesis 36, 20. The Horims also dwelt in where? Seir. Okay, this is Seir's people. But the children of Esau, what? Succeeded. Succeeded them. When they had what? Destroyed them from before them and dwelt in their stead. Look at that. So what Esau did was he lived uh, with Seir. And they were a family. But think about it. Esau had a, a huge following that grew out of that. Now, if you give it about 100 years, you think they're all going to get along? Dad, uh, Daddy and Grandpa and the great-grandpa is all dead, perhaps. And as the people keep growing, the land ain't big enough for the both of us. So they're going to fight it out. Esau won. And Esau took over Seir's territory. But the thing to know about Seir's people that a lot do not know about. When you read verse 19 uh, or verse 21, we're going to look at verse 21. A people great, a people great and many and tall as the Anakims. But the Lord destroyed them before them and they succeeded them. Somebody succeeded these giants and dwelt in their stead as he did to the children of Esau, which dwelt in Seir when he destroyed the Horems from before them. And they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead even unto this day. Do you see that? But also go back. Uh, I didn't read this part. If we look at verse 10, verse 10. The Emons dwelt therein in times past, the people great and many and tall, as the Anakims, which also were accounted, what? Giants, Giants as the Anakims, but the Moabites called them Emons. The Horims also dwelt in Seir before time, but the children of Esau succeeded them. See that? So it seems like right here that Esau was able to conquer basically that Nephilim bloodline or the giant's bloodline. He took over their territory. Now, if you look at, uh, keep your hand at Deuteronomy 2, we are going to go back and forth here. We're going to go back and forth here. I want you to go to Genesis, the book of Genesis. Don't forget the Rephaims, right? Rephaim was also another name that I had given to you for the Nephilim. Go to Genesis 14. Genesis 14. Go to Genesis chapter 14. Notice verse 5, verse 5. Now notice that they were close to Sodom and Gomorrah. They were close to Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 14, 5. And the 14th year came Chedorlaomer and the kings that were with him and smote the who? Rephaim. Sorry, right? I, won't exp I won't go all over there. You know that's uh, related to Nephilim, I told you. In Ashtoreth in Carnaim. 
and the Zuzims in Ham, and the Emims. Wait, Deuteronomy 2, right? Those giants. In Sheva Kiriathahim. And the who? Horites in their, their Mount Seir. They're all close to each other. They're all close to each other. You see that? And where is this alongside the path of? Look at verse 8. And there went out the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah. They lived close to Sodom and Gomorrah. What was Sodom and Gomorrah's problem? Homosexuality, same sex. Oh, it's more than that. It's more than that. They were doing LGBTQ plus, 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 and really plus. That's what they were doing. Go to Jude. Go to Jude. Basically, they had the liberal mentality of if it feels good, then just do it. If it makes you happy, then just do it. And that was a huge abomination to God because that's how the Nephilim were born. Go to the book of Jude. So Esau, you can see right here, he married into a family line that had traces of Nephilim blood. So that was an abomination to God. It's very despised to him. So I'm not saying his children came out all Nephilim, but he was marrying into a family that had Nephilim traces. That's the bottom line. If you look at Jude, and then look at verse uh, 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, Look at this. And the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication. See, they were, sex, they were, doing, they were doing sexual experimentation. And going after what? Strange. strange flesh. Strange flesh ain't just, hey, homosexuality is strange. Are you kidding me? That's not the only thing that's strange. Bestiality is strange. I'll tell you what's strange. Incest is strange. I'll tell you what's strange. A lot of other stuff that you can do. God knows what they were doing right there. So a lot of strange sexual activity. Strange flesh means other flesh. All right? If it means other flesh, then that means it's abnormal. What they were doing is, in verse 6, even as Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 7, right? So Sodom and Gomorrah was following even as what? They're following in like manner of who? Verse 6, the angels. What is verse 6 talking about? You know, Genesis 6. The angels intermingled with mankind. That's how the giants came out, right? See, Sodom and Gomorrah want to repeat that. And then Mount Seir, that area, because they're close by, obviously they learn. What do people learn? If there's one thing we learn here in America, we like to copycat other nations. We look at something demonic they do and we go, why can't we be like that? And we try to do our own experimentation and follow along. History repeats itself constantly, constantly. So uh, Esau's people were doing that, or excuse me, uh, Mount Seir was doing that. And then Esau married into that family who's supposed to be, who's coming from a say believing family, but they marry into that line. So God was very angry with that. Okay, but that's not the clue about Nephilim. That's not the clue. The clue, you wouldn't believe it, all right? I will tell you at verse 24, you wouldn't believe it. There's a reason why the Lord put that comment there. And some people are like, what's the big deal with that verse? I think there's something deeper there. We will cover that next time. So as you look at a mule... We'll see, okay? What do mules have to do with that, right? I will tell you next time, all right? All right. If any of you have questions, then ask some of our brothers who are probably connecting dots right now with that verse, okay? Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and that it increased our knowledge of the Scripture in every word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.